love that. I love that. I love that. I love that. I'd like to play the whole album. We only have an hour or so here, maybe a little less. I'm Carlton Pearson, and welcome again to um, Streaming Consciousness, our weekly telecast, broadcast, internet cast, I should say. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk to you tonight, as I talked earlier in my email post, about um, a post that I actually put out today titled, our, our History is Not Our Destiny. And, of course, I'm 60 years old, so I'm thinking a lot about history, my history, your history, his, his, his story or her story, her story, his story. That's generally a reference to Jesus, the Christ, that we started using that term in English based on 2,000 years ago when Christianity was organized uh, as a religion and as an institution and as an organization through Constant, Constantine, the Roman emperor. I've talked a lot about that over the last several months, and you can, you can go into the yeah, archives and hear me talk more about Pisces and horoscopes and Zodiac, and I'll allude a little bit to that tonight, but that's not the full thrust of my talk. I'm very time-sensitive in this because um, I'm in the second half of my life. I'm comparing, not competing, I'm comparing what I did in the past, the first 50 years of my life, this last 10 years when I've been that sort of in-between seasons and trying to grasp my new and renewed consciousness and um, find out how my past fits into my present and will project me into my future and all of that does work together. I believe that sometimes God or the universe uses our past as a rehearsal for our future, not identically, but there are certain structures and patterns within our past that we've learned from our past and during our past that really are relevant today. Not all of them, but many of them are. So many people are restless and, and asking questions and uncomfortable with where they are in life and where they are in time and where the church is and religion is and where their taste buds spiritually and otherwise are. What's happening to me? What's happening? I get so many emails and letters and Facebook messages from people who are asking questions and they're asking me questions assuming that I might have at least a response if not an answer. So history is the study of past events particularly in human affairs. Our history, and I'm quoting Olin Cohen, our history is not our destiny or our destination where we're ultimately going. Destiny is the hidden power believed to control what will happen in the future. People are talking about that. That's fate or destiny. This is some un, this invisible power that controls what ultimately will happen. Sometimes we believe that. Sometimes we want to believe it. Sometimes we question it. Sometimes we're just totally insecure about it. But we, we like to think there's some higher source or force in the universe that um, is ultimately directing the affairs of creation. People of faith believe that they're created in the image and likeness of God, that we're all created as gods in the earth, um, that we are part of God's representation on the planet, that we have something to say, something to do, something to become, something to be. So destiny is the hidden power believed, in, and that hidden power, of course, for many of us is God. Um, day in Latin, it comes from the Latin term, destinare, day meaning intensity, stenare, to stand with intensity, to stand or stay in in the current flow, um, to stand uh, in the current flow of time um, or in the time continuum, to be current and to be in the current. I don't just want to be current. I want to be in the current, in the flow. A current is a body of water or air moving in a definite direction, especially uh, in which there is le through a, a larger area which there is less movement. It's like a specific specified streak or current or flow within the larger time expanse. Now that's a little bit scientific and I, I, I'm not anything into quantum theory and what have you, but I'm just talking about we move through time, not the other way around. Time really doesn't move. It, it's infinite. It's endless. It's ageless. It's spaceless. Indeed, time is timeless. So when you're current, you're specified and specific you're, you're in your specified or specific movement. You're in the specific momentum. You're in that space and place where you are assigned and designed to be. That's very important to know and to recognize. And we want to be there. We're both designed and assigned to do and be current. To do the, 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 uh, 
what is current and to be what is current, to be in, in current or in time. Nobody wants to be late. Everybody wants to be right in the flow of everything. That's normal. That's common. But it's also speci- special and it's also specific. I don't want to be current. I, I just belonging to the present time and happening and being used in the now. And I want that, but that's not all I want. I want to be in that special flow, the movement of, with the mass of moisture, of consciousness and awareness. There is, a, there is a massive moisturized moment of time and consciousness, and I'm sensing it. It's, it's transcendent. It's spiritual. It's powerful. I'm in it and you're in it. And so what does that mean? There's a mass, moist movement of consciousness that I'm in, and it's the largest mass move of consciousness uh, that I've ever experienced since I've been on the planet, 60 years. And I've been in a Pentecostal-type, spiritualist, transcendent-type religion where we pray and fast and meditate and weep and we transcend and we have dreams and visions. And I've been that way all my life, four generations. So I have a certain sensitivity. I can sense the times. I can sense people. Uh, I can read my audiences. I can feel my audiences. I have for many, many years. Sometimes I would minister in what they call the word of knowledge when I would discern something that was occurring in that person's life, knowing nothing about them, and sort of address it in a non-specific way so as not to expose them or make people uncomfortable about coming to my services. But as I'm led, I would just do that. I was moved by the Spirit or by Spirit to say something or see something uh, or to refer to it in a way that... uh, confirms and affirms in the soul or, uh, in the, or the life of the person that they're on the right track. And some people need that. In a sense, I've always been in this flow. I just excluded myself from or refused to be aware of or welcoming to this larger flow. And that's just because of the way I was, ri- I was written. I had this, uh, the way I was raised, I had this straight and narrow mentality or mindset that both precluded and excluded me from the larger expression or procession, if you will, uh, and precluded and excluded me from the larger awareness. I just just, uh, thought that it was me, you know, and us in this little world of Pentecostal fundamentalism, uh, Protestantism, protesting, (laughs) that everybody was going to hell and not enough people were getting saved or healed or blessed including me and my family, the people I loved and served in ministry. And so there's been these, um, it's, it's, it's my religious proclivities and proximities uh, that made me afraid to deviate into un or less familiar waters in this vast ocean of consciousness and culture. I was limiting myself, and many of you are. There was this, 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 wor- this vast world of, of possibilities, this universe of uh, possibilities and and we've been just uh, uh, wading out into the very shallow waters even when Jesus said cast your net and cast out into the deep to the depths go out there where you either have to walk on water or swim of course we're in a boat get out into the deep don't have the fish fishing pole mentality just you know catching an individual fish cast out the net and be inclusive Pull everything up that's out there. Sort through it and see what you'll find. We must stay in touch. We must be present and engaged not only with what is, but with what is and and what is becoming. We want to be in tune. We want to be in touch. We must be engaged not only with what is, but what is becoming. There's something coming. It's becoming. It's being right now. I can see it on the horizon. I know something powerful is occurring. Being in touch and in tune with the moment, hear this, the movement and the momentum, that is the process and progress, is a significant part of the role of of being human, being alive, being alert, being aware. In this light, we don't grow old, but if we don't grow, we become old. If we stop growing, we don't grow old, but if we stop growing, (laughs) we become old. Now, I'm sensitive about that because I realize that I'm aging. That's not a negative term. I'm progressing. Aging just means I'm progressing. It doesn't mean I'm getting old. I'm progressing. I'm going to the next level of my own personal experience. I'm going to experience myself and experience my soul. Um, The word old means basically belonging only or chiefly to the past. That's the way I'm describing it. To a former or previous reality. There are some powerful former and uh, previous realities 
and I'm not, but I'm not tied to those, neither am I confined by them. Uh, I'm not confined to them or defined by them. That's part of a description of my person, but it's not exactly what, and you too, you are evolving, you are expanding, and everything that has happened in your past is critical and pivotal to your present and to your future. It had a role to play. How do you complete the past? You complete the past by complementing it. To complete, not competing with it, completing it, which means to cast a compliment. I don't care how bitter or painful or seemingly misfortunate or unfortunate some of the things you went through were. They are compliment. Salute them. Salute everything that has happened. Celebrate it. Honor it. Because it, it, it made you who you are. You created it and you are responsible for it, if not to it. So own it, come on into to, to embrace who you have become as a result of it, and let's keep making headway. Let's keep, keep on going down the road. This is important. This is powerful. This is passionate. And I want you to be a part of it. So uh, it's not negative, necessarily negative to be old or unfortunate to be old. It depends on what and where you want to be and how you want and intend to be that. How do you want to be current? Do you want to be current? Now, Jesus is recorded. Let's go on and talk to this song that I opened up with. Jesus is recorded to have said, Lo, and that's sort of the King James Version where I am with you always, even till the end of the King James Version mistranslates the word world. It's really the word aeon in Greek, where we get the English word eon. Age. Lo, I'm with you always. Even to the end of the age. Remember, there is no such thing in Scripture as the end of the world, the cosmos. People are waiting for the apocalypse to happen in the Revelation and all this. Apocalypse doesn't mean destruction. <laughs> apocalypse doesn't mean catastrophe or disaster. Apocalypse means revelation, the unveiling. There's, there's scales being pulled off our eyes. Layers of tradition are being peeled off me, I know, and I think off the culture at large. We are at a time of revelation, enlightenment, insightfulness, a time of curiosity, a time of questioning and querying and looking as far as you can see, anticipating, feeling, not being definite but being infinite, unending, ageless and timeless and endless. Embracing that reality, your infinite self, your essence, your immutable self, evolving, and unchangeable. I mean the essence of you. The spirit part of you. So he, he says in Matthew 28, Lo, I'm with you always, even at the end of the world. The original text doesn't say world. It's, you know, it's, it's the word aeon. The age or an era. And that, that actually means in Greek, a period marked by spiritual or moral, that, that means custom. Whatever is custom is the moral. Whatever is customary is considered moral. As customs change, Morals change. Now that's where people are uncomfortable, because in, like here's here's an example, in the South Pacific, females and in other parts of the world were topless, and the missionaries went to Hawaii, and the first thing they wanted to do, the missionaries from Britain would go to to the South Pacific, and the first thing they wanted to do was have the women cover up their breast, because that was immoral, it, only to the Britons. To the missionaries, it wasn't immoral to the South Pacific uh, natives, the natives of the islands, the Hawaiians, or where, where in the South Pacific they were. They, it wasn't immoral or uncustomary to them. And they, they're, they're concerned about lust. The men over there also were topless. They weren't lusting after the women in the same way that the, the missionaries were lusting. The missionaries were struggling. The missionaries were having trouble with the customs. So, customs and morals are a rel relative term. Some other parts of the world, people are completely nude. Like Adam and Eve supposedly were in the Garden of Eden. Completely unrobed or disrobed. Now, could you handle that? Most of us couldn't. There are people who today live in nudist colonies. That's their custom. It's not immoral there. You can't arrest somebody in a nudist colony for being immoral or for indecent exposure. So all this has to do with how we relate to certain circumstances in our lives. Now, Jesus says, I'm with you to the end of the era, to the end of this age. Hmm. The Son God, or the Son of God, Jesus, 
age of Pisces, hear this now, has ended. Now don't be alarmed, just let me talk to you, okay? Jesus is recorded to have said in Luke 22, 11, and he said to them, when you have entered the city, this is the night of the Last Supper, the Passover feast, Jesus would have with his disciples. Tomorrow at 9 o'clock in the morning, he would be on the cross, according to the document. By 3 o'clock in the afternoon, he'd be transitioned. He'd be dead. He was gone. Six hours. Six is the number of man. Six feet under the number of flesh in biblical numerology. That's I'm throwing these things in probably too much. Anyway, he said, when you have entered the city, he says this to his disciples, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. A pitcher, not pick. A pitcher of water. Follow him into that house. That house of Pisces or Aquarius, the water bearing male. Now, it was very unusual, mind you, it was very unusual in that day, 2,000 years ago, for a man to be carrying a pitcher of water. That's something that women did primarily. Men hunted and fished, and they would. Uh, kill menacing animals, animals or catch them for food. Women would go to the woman at the well, the Samaria, both in the Old and New Testament. Jacob met his wife at the well, the woman of Samaria, the woman of the well. That that's, it was a female deal. So here we see Jesus alluding to very possibly men doing things that women have done and would suggest the opposite, that women would be doing things that men professionally do or customarily do. We're in a strange day, aren't we? This is an unusual day. It's hard to, 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 um, to calculate or discern the season. We're, we're sort of sorting and navigating through uh, uncharted waters, at least to us. But we're out here. I'm not resisting the waters. I'm not condemning or damning or dooming the sea. This is where we are. It is what it is. So embrace this moment. Remember, our, our, our history does not define our destiny or the destination. Take a risk. We can't tell you exactly where we're going. We just know we're in, move, we're in the movement. We're in the momentum. There is momentum. There's a move. We're seizing the moment. We're becoming a part of the moment. We're expressing ourselves in and as the moment. We can't get away from it. Those who are enlightened, those who are alerted, those who are aware, we're not alarmed. We're just alerted. We're not alarmed. We're just alive. <laughs> we're not alarmed. We're just aware. That's okay. In fact, that's powerful to be alerted and alarmed, or alerted and uh, uh, alive to what is going on in the earth. So he says, when you've entered the, that, that city, a man will meet you with carrying a pitcher of water. I'm quoting the scripture. Follow him into that house. The Hebrew word for zodiac is mazoroth. And it's mentioned only once in the Bible, the book of Job, 38th chapter, 32nd verse, when he's explaining to Job, supposedly according to the narrative. Job was asked all these questions about God, why is this happening to me and my children, my family, I'm sick and I'm a man of wisdom and I'm, people come to me from all over the world for counseling and look what's happened to me, I've lost my ten children and my wife has left me and blah, blah, blah. Then in, towards the end of the book, and most folk don't read the end of the book because Job is very depressing. <laughs> and everybody feels a little bit of a Jobin thing that they are experiencing some of the passion or sh pain of Job. But when God's explaining, according to this narrative, when God is explaining to Job what is happening to him, he asks him the question, where were you when I created the waters and told them to come this far, no farther? You ought to just read from like chapter 35 to the end of the book and it'll be quite refreshing and revealing to you. But anyway, the word zodiac appears. He says, do you know about the zodiac? You know about the signs of the times? Are you alerted to anything? Even Jesus said... Uh, you know how to interpret the weather, but you don't know how to interpret or discern the signs of the times. God itself is recorded to have said in Genesis, uh, the stars in the heavens are for signs. The stars in the heavens are for signs. Even the word pa-a-star is in association with stargazing. We worship on Sunday, then there's moon day. We're very into astrology. Monasticism comes from the word moon. Monastery, moon, night times, people who look and study the stars. And, and God said to, as recorded to have said to Abraham in I think the 15th chapter of Genesis, um, look at the stars and count them if you can. That's where your potential is. Pay attention to the heavens. 
Pay attention to the seasons. Pay attention to the signs. Pay attention to the times. Be current. Jesus said, I I will be with you to the end of the age, to the end of the season, or the end of the session. There was a session or a season, a Piscean age, the fish, Ichthus, our Lord cometh, Maranatha. Uh, many people still have those fish on those though, on their on their uh, cars and things. I remember, I'm Pisces. I'm, I'm born under that sign, so I understand the the, the meandering depths of, of the seas. I love to be near the water. I was born in Southern California. I love the Pacific Ocean. I loved when my dad took us to the beach. I don't even I didn't even know why. I didn't understand the association. When I moved to Oklahoma, I always had water running in my house. The last place we lived, uh, we had the pool right outside, but it had a fountain that was running. I used to have water walls. I was always attracted to water. In my homes, when I didn't, and we had the, the Arkansas River, I used to drive alone by up and down the river there in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, because I love, I was drawn to the water. I like deep sea fishing more than freshwater fishing in the lakes, and I've done them both. I like skiing, uh, jet skiing more than the other skiing. Uh, I don't know how to surf, but I, I like to watch surfers. One of my favorite vacations is to go to the West Coast and, and uh, check in a hotel there. Sometimes I have a friend that has a lovely home on the beach and just watch the sea lions and the dolphin uh, and, 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 and go walk along the beach or plunge into it. I love the water. I love the depths, the misty, moist depths of the oceans, the seas. You never know when you go deep sea fishing what you're going to bring up. That's what I like the most about it uh, as, as opposed to freshwater fishing. And I've been out many, many times. My pastor, Bishop J.E. Blake, used to take me out on the seas of the Pacific Ocean. When I went to Corpus Christi, we went deep sea fishing down there in the Gulf. So I love the water. Now, Jesus also said this. I must go so the comfort. Now, here's the, the real delicate part. Jesus said to his disciples, I must go so the comforter will come. I must go. Now, Neither the people then of his day nor ours have let him go. Therefore, and this is just my opinion, we've never really experienced the fullest extent of the comforter. We've not been fully comforted as believers, as church folk, as Christians. We've, we've experienced the emotion, the commotion, and the, de- the devotion connected with the, the comforter. I'm a Pentecostal, the Holy Ghost. But there's been a lot of stress and duress and anger and and um, pain. And Jesus said, I must go so the comforter. I'm not saying the comforter didn't come. But we have not experienced that transcendent awareness to the, the level that we can because we're stuck on Jesus. He said, let me go. And we said, no, we're going we're gonna to keep you here. In fact, we're going to build a whole religion around you. And we're going to call it Christianity. We're not letting you go. They may kill you, you may die, but we're not going to let you go. Even though you said you needed to go in order that. Now, Jesus was a man, the comfort of Parakletos in Greek, one called alongside to help, to inspire hope, to nurture us. That part makes us feel like orphans. We've not been nurtured. We have dogma and doctrines and disciplines uh, and, and rituals and rites, and rules. But we've not been nurtured. That comforting, actually the Holy Spirit is that feminine aspect of God. The more tender, nurturing aspect. We see God as judgmental and, and ruling and, and um, uh, wrathful and angry and jealous. The comforter, like the dove, the spirit, the gentle, peaceful. You, that's why Christians are so angry tend to be so bitter and so militant and vindictive and angry. They want to fight onward Christian soldiers fighting for the right. You know, I understand that mentality, this victim consciousness. People who are victim conscious become victimizers. And we've been, the Christian expression in many ways, not the pure, sweet, humble, simple, and there's much of that out there, and I experience a lot of that coming up. But the institutional expression is haughty and arrogant and exclusive and pious and pompous and mean. That era is coming to an end whether you like it or not. The whole Catholic Church, which is the largest global expression, legitimate, legalistic, I should say, official expression of Christianity, Roman Catholicism, 
Look what's happening in it. Look what's happening to it. And study history and find out what happened through it. Oh my gosh. His story. His story is not the one we've been telling. His story is not the one we've been experiencing. His story is not the one that is Christ, that is Christ-centered. It is Christianity-centered. It is religion-centered. It is not relationship-centered. And that's been the thing that uh, I think Spirit has been moving me toward. I didn't know I was going to go this far. I'm 60 years old. It's like starting all over again. Literally. This is my ministry. That, when you who support, and please remember, we're trying to raise $250,000 to, uh, to have panel discussions and get some update the equipment, update the site, to build a large uh, uh, church without walls, a cyber church without walls that's totally diverse, radically inclusive, expanded consciousness. I got, I think, three or four letters from South Africa from ministers that are so interested in this move and in this movement and what's happening in that country. And I hear from ministers, and I remember I got one from, from Portugal and Malaysia and, and way up in Alaska. There's all kinds of interest everywhere. Australia, quite a movement in London, a lot of people listening and thinking. And, and so we want to expand this and create the ebooks. And I'm doing another, uh, we're talking about doing another publishing deal. To make my next book, I'd like for it to be called You're Not in Trouble, You're in Transition. I love that thought because people are feeling this restlessness, but I want to minister to you about making, managing, and mastering change. Making, managing, and then mastering change because change just keeps on changing. We don't know where this is going to end. Everybody's just feeling this restlessness. It's pretty powerful. So the comforter, um, global peace and deep inner comfort can occur to all people and indeed it is scheduled to occur but we must relinquish one paradigm to embrace a new one Jesus said again I must go (laughs) so the comforter may come the last 2000 years is called the Christian era the Christian age and now as awkward and bothersome it is for some of us This is part of the post I put today. We are entering a post-Christian era or a post-Christian age in which spiritual or moral customary characteristics are changing. You may not like it, but the, the characteristics are changing. Jesus was the umbilical cord connecting millions to God. The umbilical cord was the life source when the Christian body, the ethereal, was Growing a growing fetus, something um, some two thousand years ago, we were like a growing fetus. We've been growing uh, like a fetus uh, for two thousand years. We must now cut the umbilical cord and learn to live outside the womb of Christianity. Just listen. That is possible. There was life outside the womb. There's life outside the religion. There's life outside the dogma and the doctrines, even outside the Bible. Just just listen. History is being revealed. Information is coming to us so fast we can't keep up with it. If you st- you can just go to the History Channel or read the 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 the, uh, the books and the documentations of history, and you'll find out that Christianity has duplicated many mythological and even pagan practices that preceded it by as many as 4,000 years. I'm not apologizing and I'm not even complaining. This is just an observation. Something's got to happen. Something is happening. I've given you, I've touched on this in several of these lectures. So you can go just look at the the titles of the different uh, messages in our archives if you want to know more about it. We must learn to... to to eat, to live, and survive independent of the cord connection and finally allow our connection to God to be spiritual. Not umbilically religious. We don't need the cord connection. We gotta cut, literally, cut the umbilical. Jesus, the man and person, has been physically gone for over 2,000 years. Everybody he healed is dead. Everybody he raised from the dead 
is dead. We are to do greater works. What does that mean? How can we move beyond? How can we go to the next level? Uh, why are we afraid to? And, and why would we? Why should we be afraid to? And we really shouldn't be afraid to. It's just something that we've kind of gotten involved in. And I want to read to you, as I have many times before, uh, Hebrews uh, 6 and 1 through uh, one uh, through 3. I meant to have it here. But it's, it's very powerful, and you'll get it. It's, 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 um, it can be very helpful to you. This is something that we don't know who the writer of the book is, but here's what he says. Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ. Now, this is in your Bible. Let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity. That was written 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago. Have we? Some people have. And... But people don't call them Christians anymore. Some folks put on my face. How can you call yourself a bishop? How can you call yourself a Christian and you don't believe in Jesus? I do believe in Jesus. He's my hero. My champion. Study his life. I don't worship Jesus. I used to think I was supposed to. I don't worship Jesus. I follow Jesus. I worship God. Jesus never invited or expected people to worship him. They did. But it wasn't by his invitation or instruction. There's, many, there's a few places in the scripture where it says they worshipped him. But that was not something he asked. We worship our pastors. We worship bishops. We worship entertainers and athletes and politicians and shaman and gurus. There are people who, who have worshipped me over the years and a whole lot of other gifted preachers or singers or teachers. Everybody has their following. <laughs> and followers, rock stars do. Hitler was worshipped by the whole, all of Eastern Europe. Oprah is worshipped. Eckhart Tolle is worshipped. Deepak Chopra is worshipped. Every pastor, in a sense, is worshipped, valued, and revered. And in the Catholic Church, you have to go through the priest or the Pope, the vicar of Christ, supposedly, to get to God. And I'll talk more about that. But anyway, let us move beyond the elementary teachings of Christ and be taken forward to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death. What? Don't lay the foundation. Repentance? I'm sorry, God, for my sins. And a faith in... Whoa, and a faith in God? Go beyond that? Leave that beside? Instruction? It's about baptisms or cleansing rites? Rituals? Leave that aside? The laying on of hands? Oh, my God. The resurrection of the dead? I'm reading your Bible. Eternal judgment? Leave it. And the writer says, God permitting, we will do so. Who's done so? You can't hardly find a, a Christian church on any given Sunday of the, of the year, 52 of them, that they won't be preaching something from that, one of those subjects that he says to leave and uh, go beyond. He didn't say abandon the teachings of Christ, but go beyond, transcend them. There is an experience of God and good beyond the teachings of Christ, fundamental teachings of Christ. Now, I'll never stop talking Christ consciousness because that consciousness has always been on the planet. I think it always will be. There will always be men and women who reflect and remind us of the divinity that we all are and try to guide us that way. They're usually cut down, assassinated or executed or crucified. Cruz is the Latin word for cross. Exfixiation. Crucifixion is asphyxiation on a cross. Yes, there have been people who've tried to crucify me and still try to. And now they're going to say, he's the Antichrist. Hear me out. Hear the whole message that I'm trying to share with you today. Go beyond that. To the, the King James Version says to perfection. The word, whenever you see it in the New Testament, it means maturity, spiritual adulthood. The maximization of your consciousness as a spiritual adult, not a child, there's sometimes Jesus says, except you become as children. He talks, he's talking about the innocence of promise, ageless, timeless, and endless promise and innocence. But there's a place that you, you must grow in grace and in the knowledge of God. Grow in grace. Are you growing or just surviving? Are you growing or just existing? Are you experiencing different elements and aspects of yourself that are powerful and appealing and, and fascinating? 
that are a major turn on? Do you get spiritually aroused? Or do you go to church and just kind of go through the same ritual? Does everything taste the same anymore or still? <laughs> Jesus is gone. Jesus, the man in person, has been physically gone for 2,000 years. He told his disciples he would go away and prepare a place for them. That place is consciousness. Everything is consciousness. My father's house, there are many mansions or dimensions, levels, floors, places, spaces, and paces of consciousness. I will go prepare one for you, a place. Actually, the word place in Greek is topos where we get the word topic or topography. I will go prepare grounds for you, again, in consciousness. Topography, topics of discussion of the soul, places to soar like an eagle. Oh, my. Places to become, spaces to become, paces, momentums, movements, modalities, ways of being, ways of seeing, ways of thinking, ways of expressing, ways of experiencing, ways of exposing your very soul into the universe. Oh my, this is heaven. Incredible. He also said he would return. Millions are waiting for the second coming. They're waiting for him to return and they never let him go. How are you going to come back and you ain't never let him go? <laughs> you want him to come back? You never let him go. Sure, he went. I, I know what that means. But in you, in your mind, you're trying to see the guy with the white robes and the blow-drawn hair, or maybe dreadlocks, <laughs> with some sandals on. And you want him to come back on a horse, like Revelation says. A horse fighting the devil? Now, that's fairy tale -like stuff. Fairy tale. Jesus is going to come back on a horse and he's going to fight the devil and there's going to be a thousand years of peace and all that stuff. You've been waiting for two thousand years for one thousand years of peace. I don't mean to sound cynical or irreverent, but study it and think about it. That's, that's fairy tale stuff. A lot of it's allegory and metaphor for something deeper, something more mature. He's not making a list, checking it twice, going to find out who's not here nice. Millions are waiting for the return. They haven't even let him go. Most don't know how to let him go. The second coming is consciousness. The second coming is awareness. The second coming is experiencing yourself in the consciousness of Christ, in the culture of spirituality, outside religion and institutions and organized organizations. There is so much more, so much more. We can have it. We can be it. We can become it. It's part of us. Jesus has been held to be the mediator between God and men. 1 Timothy 2, 5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man, not the deity, the man, not the angel, the man, Christ Jesus. Remember Jesus' favorite title for himself was Son of Man. He asked his disciples once towards the end of his life. This was actually about two years into his ministry, and the ministry only was three and a half years, uh, according to Scripture. He was, in, he was into the ministry with these guys two years, and he suddenly asked them. Now, he's out of Jerusalem up north. He's going to stay away from Jerusalem for a while because tension is rising. He knows they're going to kill him or they plan to. The disciples don't have a clue. They still don't have a clue. <laughs> two billion of them on the planet today. Um, he says, who do people say the Son of Man is? He's talking about the historical Christ, not the mystical Christ. Who do people say the Son of Man is? And all of them answered, he's Jeremiah, Ezekiel, John Baptist, one of the prophets, somebody who's dead, and he is now the reincarnation. Evidently the Jews believed in reincarnation. And Jesus didn't say that was impossible. He didn't say yea or nay. He just let them answer. What is the news on the street about my manhood, my humanhood? Who am I in their thinking? In the flesh, in nature, in the natural. And they said, well, you're one of the prophets. The people generally think you're the reincarnation of one of their great, anointed, powerful, apostolic prophets. Jews, 
wouldn't have considered uh, apostles, but it's kind of a, an equation to what we think of. Then he said to them, okay, you told me what they said. My next question is to you. Who do you say, not the Son of Man is, but who do you say, I am? Not who do you say the Son of Man is. I ask you first, who do they say or see the Son of Man as? But to his close, intimate disciples, including Judas, uh, he says to them, okay, you guys have been hanging with me for two years. You see me walk on the water, raise the dead, multiply the bread, open the deaf ears, the blind eyes, cast devils out. <laughs> who do you say I am? Which meant, who do you say you are in relationship to me? Who do you say I am? Remember that he's, God is recorded as saying to Moses in the Old Testament, I am that I am. Those two words, I am, are two of the most powerful, pivotal, poignant expressions in the human dialect. I am. Who am I? I am happy. I am whole. I am Carl Beerson. I am rich. I am poor. I am this. I am that. You've got to be careful what follows the two words, I am. Sometimes nothing should. Just I am. That I am. I don't need any other definition, any other description to that. I am that I am. I am is an unending term. I am is full of, is pregnant with promise. I am. Anything could follow that. <laughs> unlimited potential. Unlimited possibilities. Who do you say I am? Really, who do you say you are? Now, Jesus is considered the mediator between God and man. This is what we've been taught and how we have interpreted scripture. Of course, God or consciousness of the divine existed and dwelt among men before Jesus. Okay? Moses and Abraham and all the prophets of old, according to this, I'm just talking Bible, Bible ease right now, okay? A lot of people don't even believe in the Bible or they don't believe like they believe. And I've even changed some of my beliefs about Scripture, but I believe it's an, an important book. And I get a lot from it. I teach from it every week. So I don't worship it. I don't necessarily call it the divine word of God, inerrant, infallible, and the only authoritative word. That would be the King James Version, which is one of the most inaccurate translations of, of the Bible that there is that exist. That's a whole other subject. And I heard my college professor of theology at ORU say that 40 years ago. And I called Earl Roberts and wrote letters and called my mom first and said, my God, we need to fire this guy. He just told us the King James Version is an accurate trans translation. Well, when he said that, I could see my mother's Bible, my grandmother's Bible, my godmother's Bible, my godfather, my grandfather's Bible. Both I saw my whole life was in that little book. A King James Version. That's all I had. And uh, I remember when I got my first copy of the New International Version, which I think is one of the most accurate translations. In fact, that professor, Dr. Roy Hayden, worked on one of, just one of the chapters. And there were a lot of me, people helping to translate it because translation is a tedious process. There's translation and then transliteration when you, when you actually deal with alphabets of the language and compare the meanings of the alphabets. That's, a, that's even more detailed. But my when we sometimes, some of the things that I'm saying... Your mother and grandmother and grand—I mean, your whole custom, your history pops up into your mind, and it's startling to you, and you want to shut me down. I can understand that. I want to shut me down sometimes because I'm—it's like I'm having to relinquish and almost depreciate some of the things that were so valuable and virtuous to me in my past, and they were important and powerful, and I believe ordained at that time for me. This is today. I'm getting more comfortable with letting it go, leaving some things behind. It's okay. God, God consciousness existed before Jesus. Jesus appeared physically uh, on the earth. The ideology of him being the bridge or the go-between or the mediator makes us subconsciously codependent on him to both get us to God and, if necessary, protect us from God. You need Jesus to get to God, and then you need Jesus to protect you from the wrath of God. How are you going to do that? You, you put in a lot on him. <laughs> and that's what, But that's the way we've been taught. If we want to be saved, we need to get saved by Jesus, through Jesus, through the cross, through the Christ, through Calvary, 
through the sacrifice, through the torture, through the torment, through the blood, the sweat, the tears, and the fears. To be to have our sins washed away, but then we could sin again as many times as we sinned before and go through the whole process again. And then we might sin again and again as many millions go to the um, altar every Sunday or go to church and repent of that week's viol- violations. Some of which will begin the moment the benediction is prayed. Just getting out of the parking lot, someone's going to cut somebody out. Or they're looking across the room and talking about somebody's clothes and there's always a lot of gossip in the church. So this whole thing is, is just a, a vicious cycle. And I'm trying to get us to jump off that, that spinning wheel and find ourselves. This is an antichrist. I love Jesus. What I know about Jesus. We used to sing a song when I was coming. Tell me what tell me what do you think about Jesus? He's alright. Tell me what do you think about Jesus? He's alright. Tell me what do you think about Jesus? He's alright. Tell me what do you think about And we would sing that same thing. He's alright, he's alright. He's alright. He's alright. And and sing that till we would shout and cry and jump and just sort of work ourselves into a frenzy. And then we loved it. <laughs> I loved every minute of it. I wasn't bored with it. I wasn't mad about it. It wasn't weird. It wasn't crazy. It still isn't, though sometimes I see it. It looks weird because I'm seeing now from the eyes of people who are not. I'm trying to relate to people who don't know. I still know that's what, that's why I can bridge the gap. That's why this this um, Metacostal Leadership Summit that we're having here this summer, this fall, October 14th to the 16th, I hope you'll come. Uh, we will talk about this bridge, bridging the gap between the cultures and, and, and celebrating diversity. And uh, how can we create something that's meaningful to people but doesn't exclude people how can we manage this change that we're going through personally and collectively in the collective consciousness of the planet we're going to discuss it's going to be a small group in a small room nobody's going to wear ties we're going to be dressed down jeans whatever uh, running suits just relaxing we'll have meals there together uh, continental breakfast and then lunch and so we'll go out maybe at night or we'll do some things. It's not going to be a church thing. It's going to be a, a summit, a conference, a, a conclave where we're going to get together and people are coming from across the country, from businessmen and ministers and laity. Anybody can come, of course. Uh, we anticipate maybe 100 or so. Um, right here in the Congress Hotel, right across the street from Millennium Park, you can literally see the, the um, Lake Michigan and the lights and it'll be in the fall and the trees will be turning so it'll be a beautiful time to be here and the weather is nice anyway we're going to talk more about all of this this can be um, this whole idea of Jesus being the mediator I can't let him go because I can't get to God you can remember God's not outside you God expresses itself to you through you as you get in touch with who you are the Christ person you are the messianic being that lives inside of you. Stop looking to the preacher or the teacher unless they're reminding you of something you already know and have forgotten. And the best teachers do that. And I don't even call myself a teacher as much anymore because I, I like to call myself a reminder. I want to prick your memory. Help rid you of your am- spiritual amnesia so you can recall and reclaim and reconnect to who you really are. Not the imposter, not the impersonator, but who you really are unapologetically in your soul that has nothing to do with gender sexuality nationality race it has to do with your essence as a spirit being and a spiritual being as I like to say we're not just human beings looking for spiritual experiences we are spirit having an earthly encounter and you're having a human you're having a human encounter with divinity you're having a human encounter as divinity you are divine having a human experience experiencing love on a human level some aspects of anger and loneliness and fear on a human level with humans experience God is not that God experiences itself as you God experiences itself through you God expresses itself as you in you to you and through you isn't that exciting that is an inextricable inseparable connection there's not a spot where God is not. You cannot get away. David said, where shall I go from thy spirit? Where shall I flee from thy presence? If I make my, if I ascend to the, to the mountains, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, Hades, 
That's not even a Hebrew or Latin word. You're there. That's a Greek word. <laughs> Hades is the, the god of the underworld. And so that's a little slip of Greek mythology in our Bible. So David wouldn't have used those words. They wouldn't have been in the Psalms. That's not a Hebrew expression. A lot of folks don't know that. Lucifer is only mentioned in the Bible once. In the book of Isaiah. It's the word Hallel. Just like they say Hail Hitler. It's a celebratory salutation. It's an acclamation of praise to something or somebody. So we say Hallelujah in Hebrew. Yah for Yahweh, the self-existent God. Yahweh. <laughs> Hallelujah. Or they would say Hail or sal- sal- uh, a salutation of honor and reverence to a human. Yes, humans, as I said earlier, are worshipped. So those of us brought up in, as Christians remain emotionally and psychologically connected to Jesus and must, most don't know how to interpret spirituality apart from him. The alternative is to learn to, to, the alternative is to learn to interpret and experience spirituality as Jesus did. Don't, don't interpret your spirituality as Jesus. But as Jesus did, as Jesus experienced, interpreted, and expresses, expressed his spirituality, his journey, his expanded consciousness. He was trying to show us how to do that. This is what being born again really is. It's transcending ritual. It's transcending religion. Flesh gives birth to flesh. Spirit gives birth to spirit. That can happen. It's, it's happening now. And, and you can have it if you want it. I'm not in any way suggesting abandoning Jesus. I'm encouraging you to move on in consciousness, the consciousness of Christ, to a higher realm of personal transformation, revelation, and, and uh, transformation. A spiritual evolution. Something Jesus did with regard to the religion that he was raised in. You remember Hebrews 6 says, go beyond. In, let's, let's expand our consciousness. The reach of our imagination don't get stuck. Keep moving. Somebody said, Bishop, you, somebody wrote me today and said, Bishop, you seem to like quoting Hebrews 6, but what about Hebrews 12, 14, or Romans 6 and 1? Hebrews 12, 14 says, what shall we say? That shall we continue in sin that grace may be, or follow peace, excuse me, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Romans says, what shall, shall we continue in sin that grace may be? And I said, Darius, following peace with all men people is one of the basis scriptures I've chosen to support uh, by inclusion consciousness follow peace with all men are you following peace with all men or just a few in your denomination in your church in your family in your culture in your native ethnicity follow peace find peace follow after peace make peace with all men and holiness or wholeness the word means being separated hagios agree to be separated unto God or the consciousness of God to be connected with your divinity it's not a moral it's not a, word, a term referring to moral morality right there the broader metaphorical sense and metaphysical sense is that you're connected to your own divinity and holiness without mit, which no one shall see or properly accurately perceive God you've got to get out of religion into a relationship in the spirit that's what holiness is separate yourself unto God that doesn't mean that you exclude yourself from other people but you exclude yourself from the bondage of the carnal way of being egoic pride arrogance ignorance we separate ourselves detach from that and become your immutable self immeasurable immortal being that's what holiness really is it's wholeness awareness of of the self in relationship to its divinity and how that divinity is lived, walked, and worked out. This is only going to happen when you transcend the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity in the Christ consciousness. Romans 6 and 1, uh, what shall we say? Shall we continue in sin? Continue in, in sin means to continue missing the point. Because the word sin that he uses there is hamartano, not hamartia. That means offend. Hamartano means to miss the point or miss the mark. To miss the purpose for why you've come to this planet. Don't continue missing the purpose. That grace may abound. Grace is sufficient. There's always going to be grace. And there's a lot of grace on us now in our ignorance. But we can transcend all of it. We can go beyond it. We, we can get the point. And uh, we, we, to, to continue in sin, even though grace is abundant, is still a forfeiture of the fuller experiences of one's divine self and the misalignment with the fuller expression of the soul 
That's what sin is. Jesus said, flesh gives birth to flesh. Spirit gives birth to spirit. Are you ready for all this? I'm getting all kind of texts and phone calls. These folks seem to forget that I'm on live with you. Um, I want to go back to that song and um, uh, close with it. Uh, with Marvin singing it, I think, if I can find it here. There is a promise. Jesus said, I'll never leave you. In consciousness, he hasn't, because we still think about him. But as far as ritualizing and religionizing him, we need to stop that. <laughs> 